The audio content presented here dates back to the inception of my podcasting journey, spanning up to over a decade ago. Please note that the views expressed in this content reflect an earlier version of myself. As my perspectives have evolved over time, so have I. Listeners are encouraged to approach this material with awareness of its historical context. And now, on to what you've been waiting to hear. Glad to have you with us today. We appreciate you being here. I'm really excited about this episode. We're going to talk about doctrine and what the doctrine of the church is and what it isn't. And to maybe give you some background, I joined the church 17 years ago when I was 17 years old. And in joining the church, I tried to read everything I could on Latter-day Saint theology and church history. And in the process of doing that, I came across several people who instructed me, members of, of the local ward, uh, family members who, of course, my family was not members of the church, but my in-laws uh, are members of the church. They're great people. But you pick up a few things that someone will share in conversation about doctrine, and you just assume that those things are the doctrine of the church, and the things they're saying are absolutely true. And in, also in the process of reading some of the books, like Bruce R. McConkie's Mormon Doctrine, or Joseph uh, F. Smith's, or Joseph Fielding Smith's uh, Doctrines of Salvation, you come across things that you're like, well, they're teaching it. They're the leaders of the church, so it has to be the case. And so I walked away very early on with a skewed view of what doctrine was. I was very set on the earth being 6,000 years old. I was very set on evolution being completely and utterly false. In fact, one experience I've shared before, I took my kids to a natural history museum up in Cleveland, Ohio, and as we were going through this museum, we uh, we got to the section on dinosaurs, and, and we talked a little bit about that. We got to the next section, and it had the bones of Lucy. They were replicas of the bones that we had and that uh, that we have in, in have found, and these were kind of replicas made from these bones and put back together and some other bones added in to complete her look, and it talked about evolution. And I remember looking to my children in telling them flat out, you know, kids, ignore this stuff. The world will teach these things, but this is false. That they have taken a few bones that they have found, and as you can see, they have reconstructed this whole idea of evolution. And I implored my children to, to consider that a false thing and to recognize that the church teaches that evolution is, is false or a heresy, as Elder McConkie put it. So... Going through the church, it was probably a big part or played a giant role in in my own personal faith crisis because I finally came to terms with a lot of things that the church said, and I shouldn't say it that way, a lot of things that the church seemed to say because its leaders wrote it in a book or its leaders shared their opinion at one time or another. And so I had adopted these things and it set up a false paradigm that I was... I was basing my testimony on. So at some point, I kind of grasped that doctrine wasn't as simple as I saw it, that it wasn't every single thing that a leader uh, spoke about. So realizing that some of our misconceptions come about naturally, it's not that we were doing this, you know, making this false paradigm intentionally, it's completely accidental. And it's somewhat set up by the fact that we belong to a church that claims authority and claims to be the only true and living church upon the earth. And so we expect the oracles of our Heavenly Father, his prophets, seers, and revelators, to get their marching orders from the Savior every day and to then not make any mistakes in sharing those marching orders. But that's where it has to change. We have to recognize that these men are men, that they are human, that while they are led by inspiration and revelation, that it is not something that controls every word that comes out of their mouth, and that they have the opportunity in their lives to share their opinions and to talk about things without every word being condoned or dismissed by Heavenly Father or the Savior face to face with them. And so seeing that, let's begin to kind of talk about this. Elder B.H. Roberts explained what official doctrine is. He said, The church has confined the source of doctrine 
by which it is willing to be bound before the world to the things that God has revealed, and which the church has officially accepted, and those alone. These would include the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price. These have been repeatedly accepted and endorsed by the church and general conference assembled, and are the only sources of absolute appeal for our doctrine. And so essentially what he leaves it up to is those those things that are accepted as scripture and those things that have been accepted uh, under the common consent law of the church. And so while we recognize that the prophets and apostles receive inspiration and, and direction on different things, that doctrine is a much more consolidated box of items. Somewhat more recently, in 2007, the church issued a press statement release that defined official doctrine this way. It said, The First Presidency, in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, counseled together to establish doctrine that is consistently proclaimed in official church publications. This doctrine resides in the four standard works of the Scripture, the Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine of Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. President Harold B. Lee says this. He said, It is not to be thought that every word spoken by the general authorities is inspired, or that they are moved upon by the Holy Ghost in everything they write. I don't care what his position is. If he writes something or speaks something that goes beyond anything that you can find in the standard works, then obviously he concludes that that should be taken lightly and not necessarily considered doctrine. So there are five places where this kind of happens, and I just want to talk about four of them. And so when we talk about the ways that we get our our beliefs misconstrued on this on this item, they fall into what I want to talk about these four categories. One is official talks and statements. Two is official publications. Three is official policy and procedure. And four is books written by general authorities. And so in the midst of this, we can almost universally say that anywhere where our view of doctrine became skewed, it happened in one of these four ways. The fifth one they talk about is conventional wisdom. But I think just because something is conventional wisdom, I think most of us outside the church looking at the conventional wisdom would recognize that not everything is true. So uh, moving on. We would talk about the four of these things, official talks and statements. So General Conference, for instance, is a place where official talks are found. But just because something is spoken in General Conference does not make it doctrine. We have to recognize that these men have prepared well. These men and women have, have pondered on things. They have helped, ha asked the Lord to lead them in the things that they say. But even with Elder Packer's talk a year or two ago, there were a few words that he said that afterward he had changed because it didn't convey the appropriate line of, of discussion on the subject. And so these things are not written in stone and dead set as doctrine. We have to realize that. So moving on, while uh, many members say that statements by the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve are official, uh, history shows that the statements by these men are not uh, automatically doctrine. And I can give you a few examples. Polygamy, at some times in the church's history, was taught as essential for salvation. And there were comments that that, that was the case. Again, not doctrine. The Adam-God theory was taught in part by Brigham Young, but at different times... Two pages later, in the same discourse, he would he would revert back to separating himself from this this line of thinking, and so it seems like Brigham was sharing his opinion, sharing some impressions that he got, but not saying, "Hey, you know, I've received revelation. This is absolute." In fact, uh, Spencer W. Kimball, president of the church, back in the 70s, made the comment that the Adam God doctrine is absolutely false and that it is not an accepted doctrine of the church. Lots of uh, leaders in the church have discussed the idea that Africans would never receive the priesthood, 
In fact, when that revelation came, Elder McConkie, in one of his talks to the CES, asked that that members of the church and those outside the church forget anything that he, Brigham Young or others, had said on the topic, and asked uh, to recognize that while they shared their opinion, now God had given revelation, and now doctrine had been set. Joseph Fielding Smith said man would never set foot on the moon. Again, his opinion. And so we have lots of these. So, moving on, we also have policies that are not official. The the family, a proclamation to the world, while truly inspired, while a wonderful document littered with truth throughout, simply has not been uh, approved by membership of the church in a vote of common consent. And so because of that, it is not an official uh, binding statement, although I would guess that sometime in the next few years or decade, you're going to see that occur. President David O. McKay is a big reason why we don't have crucifixes on the church. It was an opinion of his that he did not approve of them, and so we've kind of held on to to that idea for, for a long time. Uh, President Heber J. Grant talked about the word of wisdom and how certain things were excluded for the, from that and the things that we should stay away from but but there's no claim to any revelation uh, in his his thoughts on these changes so we can see really easily that there are things that have been said by leaders of the church that again are not official or binding they are simply these these men's values opinions so let's go to, for a moment to Elder D. Todd Christofferson member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as he kind of expounds on this uh, a little bit. The president of the church may announce or interpret doctrines based on revelation to him. Doctrinal exposition may also come through the combined council of the first presidency and quorum of the twelve apostles. Council deliberations will often include a weighing of canonized scriptures, the teachings of church leaders, and past practice. But in the end, just as in the New Testament church, the objective is not simply consensus among council members, but revelation from God. It is a process involving both reason and faith for obtaining the mind and will of the Lord. At the same time, it should be remembered that not every statement made by a church leader, past or present, necessarily constitutes doctrine. It is commonly understood in the church that a statement made by one leader on a single occasion often represents a personal, though well-considered opinion, not meant to be official or binding for the whole church. That came from a talk in the April uh, 2012 General Conference of the Church, and this was called the Doctrine of Christ. And again, that was Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, I will link this uh, conference talk to this podcast so that you can see it there. So moving on, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the thoughts on doctrine from some other members of the church. Here's a couple of good stories from Robert Millett. Robert Millett wrote a wonderful article on doctrine. And again, I will include this uh, in the podcast as well. But this came from www.ldsces.org. And it was a long article from Elder or from Brother Robert Millet called What is Our Doctrine? And so in it he says, We can teach the gospel with plainness and simplicity, focus on fundamentals, and emphasize what matters most. We do not tell all we know, nor do we teach on the edge of our knowledge. Do you get that? Now some people say that's dishonest, right? We're not teaching everything we know. Well, I don't think that's fair. If your wife asks you how she looks in a certain outfit. Do you tell her everything that is on your mind about that? Or do you shape your answers to questions based on your audience? Now, it's not a matter of being deceiving. If you ask a question, you'll get an honest answer. But at the same time, the amount of information that you would give someone who is going to, uh, who is going to be critical of you versus someone who is willing to learn is going to be different in and out of the church. So, after that, he also says, we can acknowledge that there are some things 
we simply do not know. Now, that's important. I think in the church we have to do a better job of that. We have to sometimes just say, hey, you know what? I don't have an answer for that. When I was learning the gospel and, and taking lessons from the missionaries and joining the church, one of the things I fell in love with right away was that the church had an answer for every question I had. Any question I posed, the missionaries could go back and find something and say, here's the answer to that. So it was difficult for me to recognize that even in this church, not everything has an answer. Robert Miller also talked about an example from 1865 where the First Presidency counseled Latter-day Saints as follows. So in 1865, First Presidency of the Church said, We do not wish incorrect and unsound doctrines to be handed down to posterity under the sanction of, of great names to be received and valued by future generations as authentic and reliable, creating labor and difficulties for our successors to perform and contend with, which we ought not to transmit them, to them. The interests of posterity are, to a certain extent, in our hands. Errors in history and in doctrine, if left uncorrected by those who are conversant with the events and who are in a position to judge of the truth or falsity of the doctrines, would go to our children as though we had sanctioned and endorsed them. We know what sanctity there is always attached to the writings of men who have passed away, especially to the writings of apostles, when none of their contemporaries are left, and we therefore feel the necessity of being watchful upon these points. He makes a great point. The only problem is, too bad, this has already happened, and it continues to happen. And so every time a leader in the church writes his own little personal book, and it gets sold through Deseret Book, and if members buy it and pick it up and read it and begin to say, ooh, look at that, that's an exciting thing, look at that, some new truth. Well, we ought to be careful when things are spoken of by one leader at a given time, as Elder Christofferson points out. In fact, Elder Neil A. Anderson in the most recent General Conference added this. There's an important principle that governs the doctrine of the church. The doctrine is taught by all 15 members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve. It is not hidden in an obscure paragraph of one talk. True principles are taught frequently and by many. Our doctrine is not difficult to find. The leaders of the church are honest but imperfect men. Remember the words of Moroni? Condemn me not because of mine imperfection, neither my father, but rather Give thanks unto God that he hath made manifest unto you our imperfections, that ye may learn to be more wise than we have been. That was taken from a talk by Elder Neil L. Anderson, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, from the October 2012 conference, titled Trial of Your Faith. So recognizing, again, that lots of things become interpreted as doctrine that are simply the opinions of leaders who are imperfect men, who, again, while being led by revelation and who are inspired, simply at times say things beyond the bounds or beyond the realm of what we know. And so Robert Millet shares a couple of stories. I want to finish up with these. Robert Millet says, Some time ago, a colleague and I were in Southern California speaking to a group of about 500 people, both Latter-day Saints and Protestants. During the question and answer phase of the program, someone asked the inevitable, are you really Christian? Do you, as many, claim worship a different Jesus? I explained that we worship the Christ of the New Testament, that we believe wholeheartedly in his virgin birth, his divine sonship, his miracles, his transforming teachings, his atoning sacrifice, his bodily resurrection from the dead. I added that we also believe in the teachings of and about Christ found in the Book of Mormon and in modern Revelation. After the meeting... A Latter-day Saint woman came up to me and said, You didn't tell the truth about what we believe. Startled, I asked, What do you mean? She responded, You said we believe in the virgin birth of Christ, and you know very well that we don't believe that. Yes, we do, I retorted. She then said with a great deal of emotion, I want to believe you, but people have told me for years that we believe that God the Father had sexual relations with Mary, and thereby Jesus was conceived. I looked her in her eyes and said, I am aware of that teaching, but that is not the doctrine of the church. That is not what we teach in the church today. 
Have you ever heard the brethren teaching in conference? Is it in the standard works, the curriculum materials of the church, or the handbooks of the church? Is it a part of an official declaration or proclamation? I watched as a 500-pound weight seemed to come off her shoulders, as tears came into her eyes, and she simply said, Thank you, Brother Millet. Brother Millet, in the same discussion, said, He said, I called on a woman close to the front of the church. Her question was, How do you deal with the Adam-God doctrine? I responded, Thank you for that question. It gives me an opportunity to explain a principle early in our exchange that will lay the foundation for other things to be said. I took a few moments to address the questions. What is our doctrine? What do we teach today? I indicated that if some teaching or idea was not in the standard works, not among the official declarations or proclamations, was not taught currently by living apostles or prophets in general conference or other official gatherings, or was not in the general handbooks or official curriculum of the church, it is probably not a part of the doctrine or teachings of the church. I was surprised when my pastor friend then said to the group, Are you listening to Bob? Do you hear what he is saying? This is important. It's time for us to stop criticizing Latter-day Saints on matters they don't even teach today. Close quote. So, I hope that we can begin to make this transition of recognizing that for many of us who go through a faith crisis, it is built on a false paradigm, on things that we were taught because we read books by leaders, because uh, somebody in the sacrament gave a talk, because somebody uh, taught us a false uh, concept. Maybe they were even a missionary when they were teaching us the gospel and we took it to heart but recognizing that doctrine is much more limited and is a much smaller box of things. Thank you for joining me today. Again, you can email me at realmormon at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook at LDS Leadership Principles. You can find this podcast at mormondiscussion.podbean.com. And we're also on iTunes. God bless you. Have a great day. And may the Lord warm your shoulders.